Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. Now, usually I start our show stating our purpose to hold police accountable. And I also add that we don't just focus on negligent cops, but the system that makes bad policing possible. But as I've noted over the past couple of episodes, this pledge has become more difficult as police continue to misbehave. A big part of this problem is how obedience to law enforcement has been ingrained into our psyches. Part of that is the result of a phenomenon we have discussed before. Copaganda, the endless parade of cop shows that not only depict police as infallible moral actors, but also tireless superheroes constantly at odds with the hordes of criminals who present an existential threat to American civilization. But another facet of this drumbeat of propaganda is how sometimes the media and law enforcement collaborate behind the scenes to entrap or incriminate citizens engaged in dissent. It's a process that not only violates the basic fundamental principles of good journalism, but co-ops an institution that should be holding police accountable, not working with them. And today, we have an example of how that collaboration not only contradicts the basic tenets of journalism, as we said, but also works to stifle dissent in a country that alleges to prize it. First, it's important to note that there are critical reasons that journalists should not work hand in hand with law enforcement. For example, during the uprising here in 2015, local prosecutors asked us to turn over our footage documenting protests. The intended purpose was to investigate the actions of people who took to the streets to protest police brutality. Now, as you can imagine, we refused the request. The reason was not just a matter of principle, but of purpose. Think about it. If we had turned over the video depicting what occurred during the uprising, then our outstanding photojournalist would simply be viewed as an arm of law enforcement. Imagine if the people who entrust us with documenting their lives and stories thought for a minute that our work would be used against them. If that were the case, journalism as we know it would cease to exist, which is why the example of the collaboration we're going to focus on today is so troubling. The story involves a well-known and controversial cop watcher, Eric Brandt. Brandt is a well-known gadfly who's been at odds with Denver's legal establishment for years. He has earned recognition for a series of provocative videos calling into question the area's law enforcement tactics. He's also been criticized for allegedly making threats against public officials and public spectacles that many say are disruptive and go too far. And Brandt's outspoken and sometimes pointed language has also made him a target of police. Currently, he's facing charges of harassing and threatening public officials and is facing several court hearings, which may lead to serious jail time. But this show is not about weighing in on the charges Brandt is facing. What caught our attention is a piece of evidence that emerged during the discovery phase of one of his upcoming criminal cases. This curious piece of evidence wasn't fingerprints or eyewitness accounts or some other forensic tidbit. No, instead it was an interview with a journalist, a TV journalist who sat down with Brandt while he was awaiting trial purportedly to discuss his battle with police. But that interview was never broadcast. Instead, it was turned into evidence against him. Before we go in depth with Eric on what happened, let's watch a brief excerpt from that encounter. So did you say these things they're accusing you of saying that they're coming, they're coming for you? Um, I can't answer that question. But you're on video saying these things. I don't even know if I'm on video saying those things. I have not seen the evidence in this case yet. Did you take a live uh, streaming video as you left the courthouse? I uh, do a number of live stream videos, and I haven't had the opportunity to review my uh, evidence on this case, so I can't speak to the specifics of that case. But you were in Judge Maggot's courtroom? I did have court in Judge Maggot's courtroom, yes. I believe it's pronounced Maggot. Maggot. And do you have an issue with her, or how she handled your case? Um, I would say that um, I have uh, the vast majority of judges, I do not have issues with. I think that that there is a, a fortunately for me, uh, that, that there has been a reasonable, on average, a reasonable uh, balance of power between police authority and, and the judicial authority. Uh, there are a small number of judges that, uh, in my experience or observation or studying, I do study judges. Uh, There are a handful of judges that, in my opinion, are performing substantially under par. Now, after we reviewed the interview, we wanted to ask the Fox affiliate and the reporter who conducted it 
why it wasn't aired, and why it ended up in a criminal case as evidence. To answer those questions, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Taya, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now, you've reached out both to the reporter and the television station. What have they said? Well, so far we haven't heard back. We sent an email to the television station and to the reporter asking for comment on why and if this video never ran or this interview, and yet we have yet to receive a response. We also went through the station's website to see if there's any record of any interviews. There are some way in the past, but not recently. So it seems like this interview never aired. Now, Stephen, you've had police officers try to include you in criminal investigations before. They've tried to subpoena your work. Tell us about what happened. Well, I was covering the case of Fianga Muhammad, a man who was shot in 2006 in the back by police officers who mistook a popsicle stick in his mouth for drugs. They shot him four times in the back. He survived, and I wrote several investigative pieces revealing some inconsistency in the police testimony, and I was subpoenaed to testify in court against him by the police department. I refused to show up, and we refused to honor this subpoena. I was never indicted for that, but the threat was looming over me for a long time, so it just shows you that police will use the power of the court to try to get the media to cooperate in criminal investigations. So just recently, you came in possession of a document that actually reveals how problematic the collaboration between police and media is. Tell us about this document. Tay, yes, I have this document right here from the police department begging for changes to the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which allows officers special rights that we don't have. But what's interesting about this is it lists four police officers who are not named, but only in their initials, who have committed crimes, were convicted of crimes, and the department can't fire. Actually, though, we have exposed them. One here in this video of an officer planting drugs on a suspect, another of an officer beating up a man in a pizza parlor, which we were the ones who broke. So it just shows without the media, these officers would be able to work forever, get paid with committing crimes and being police officers. So it's important that we stay independent and free of police influence. And now I'm joined by the person at the center of this controversy, Eric Brandt. Eric, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome, Taya. Thank you for having me on. So you're a veteran, correct? You swore to defend the Constitution while in the military, but in your civilian life, you focused on the First Amendment. Why? Well, first of all, I did swear to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I'll tell you that when I was 20 years old, I don't think I really understood what that meant. Um, and there's no like deothification process when you get out of the military. So to the best of my knowledge, I've still taken this oath and it's still valid and still applies to me. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, I have not been absolved of my responsibility to my oath. And you asked the question, why have I focused on the fourth, on the first amendment? First amendment. Um, well, because, because we protected thought, beliefs and the sharing of ideas before we protected anything else and uh, you know, exactly and so as you may know benjamin franklin even himself said well poor richard said in poor richard's almanac mind your pennies and the dollars will follow right the penny is the foundation of the finance and so therefore in order to have a dollar you have to have a hundred pennies the First Amendment is the foundation. And what, what I realized very quickly on, like immediately, was that when you do it the right way, you get absolutely nothing done. When you speak up about it, there is a singular universal response. They will kick you down. And then what we have recently learned is that when they silence people's speech, they won't listen to people's speech, the people and the government will always find a balance. The government will always tell the people what level and degree of speech is necessary for their voice to be heard. And in some communities, this involves incendiary devices. Now, I'd like to ask you about some of the ways that you have exercised free speech. For example, in 2014, you were sentenced to 90 days for writing on a sidewalk. Is that correct? So if you rewind a little bit, uh, I was having issues with the Westminster Police Department. That's Westminster, Colorado. It's spelled Westminster. It's pronounced Waste Mobster. And so the Waste Mobster police were giving me issues. And I tried to co complain, and they did nothing. 
I tried to go to the mayor. I went and asked to speak to the mayor. I sat, they invited me to sit down. I was sitting there. Eight goons with guns came in to remove me from the building for no good reason. Absolutely. And that was before the famous incident where they went into my house without a warrant and removed Nicole. We talked about Nicole at a previous interview. Yeah. And then when I demanded an investigation, they said, I have no desire to fill in any blanks on what occurred. That's a quote by Commander Dean Villano in writing from the Westminster Police Department. And um, well, I desired to fill in the blanks on what occurred. So I found a big blank piece of sidewalk in front of the mayor's office and I filled the blank in with chalk. <laughs> then eight goons with guns beat me to the ground and hauled me off to jail. And I was ultimately convicted and sentenced to 90 days for riding on a sidewalk with chalk. And up until this point, there were no F-bombs. Now, you are known for provocative speech. For example, riding around with a sign in the shape of a middle finger that says F the cops, right? Why did you feel the need to become more provocative and more shocking? Well, what, what I realized from the sidewalk chalk arrest, I was a little naive. I like actually contacted the media. I thought that the media would cover this, right? And, and you know, uh, but no, they were completely disinterested in this, right? I mean, this is, we now have a new channel for our six-year-olds to become early criminals. And, and no, they weren't interested. And, and I was really that naive. I like actually thought this would get something done. And so um, I actually was pissed off at them one day. They were at my house again for a stupid reason again. And I just fucking had it. And I had been building, I was trying to make a float for the back of my bicycle with that pig on it, right? And the lettering and everything. And my friend, Nicole, whom I spoke to about, she says, well, you should make a middle finger that comes out of the ass that says, fuck the police. Well, engineeringly speaking, this is actually easier to be done from the center of the belly. And so that's where I had this prototype running and it actually was working. And I thought if I'm riding a bicycle, that little side with oh, the police, who's going to read that, right? So I just could made it more concise. And then that's where those eight letters by that guy came from. Those eight letters, it's eight letters, fuck cops. And I had it scrawled on the, the, the poster board that was the sample, my, my prototype, just in pencil. And when they came and pissed me off again one day, I snatched that sucker right off of the pig. I stuck a stick under it and I walked my dog down the street with it. And I walked six blocks and I came back into the house. And I said, oh my God, I have found the magic eight letters. And uh, I had one water bottle thrown at me. I had people yell at me. I had people stop to take pictures. Just in six blocks, I probably had 30 interactions and I knew instantly that I had found the magic eight letters. They're magical. Like there's, it would be hard to find words that are more magical than those eight letters. How many times have you been arrested or put in cuffs for your free speech activities? How many times have I been arrested or put in cuffs? Um, so the Supreme Court defines as an, an arrest as any time a, person, a reasonable person would not believe that they're free to go. And so therefore, you know, my, my, my arrest counter, I stopped counting a long time ago, um, and, but if I would estimate my count right now to be well over 200. I have been hauled off to jail probably 70 times. So we've seen a recent video from an interview with a Fox 31 news reporter. How did this happen and why? Yeah, so the interviewer, her name is Deborah Takahara, and this is Denver Channel 2, which is also labeled as Fox 31. Um, so Fox 31 news anchor Deborah Takahara, she's been a news anchor for a long time very well known. Uh, and the public information officer, Mr. Taplin, I believe is his name, came to the pod and said, hey, uh, this would be back in February, shortly after my, my triple arrests, um, the, the triple felony arrests for saying mean things, supposedly, allegedly about judges. But um, he said, Fox 31 would like to interview you are you interested in allowing the interview? And I said, sure, yeah. So um, 
they set a time and it was a few hours later then that that fox 31 was there and they brought me to a different building and put me upstairs they have rooms for attorneys and some of them are just through the glass and some of them have a table so this is one of those rooms with a table um right next to the control tower up on the sixth floor and uh Deborah Takahara and Mr. Taplin and her camera man were already in the room when I came in there. And so Taplin is the public information officer. Were you at all surprised that they allowed this interview while you were in jail? I was immediately suspicious. Um, I was excited, right, because it's very hard for me to get any media coverage. <clears throat> and for some reason, they don't like the message. And uh <laughs> you know, if I had been talking and promoting puppies and kittens, then I know I would have been on there because we see puppies and kittens on Fox 31 all the time. But <laughs> if you want to talk about what's really going on, they just really can't handle the truth. So uh, I thought that was a little surprising. I was I was excited about it, and but I was immediately trepidatious. Uh, one, because anything I say can and certainly will be used against me. Uh, and two, because, you know, that is such a dangerous charge that I've been given. So uh, so I was very trepidatious and I'm glad that I had a, a little bit of time to think about things so that when I went in there, I wouldn't be completely cold. But this is not the first time you've been accused of threatening a judge. No, it's not. Um, and, and if you do look at my actual track record, uh, I have had something like 26 charges dismissed in the last two months alone. Do you know why it didn't air? So I have no idea why it didn't go on the air. I certainly told all my supporters in the area, hey, let me know if this goes on. She interviewed me. Let's see if it goes on. She never contacted me back. They never saw the interview. They, we've checked online. They've never published it. So I don't know why it was never published, but I I certainly can speculate as to why. One, I wasn't ah, crazy, right? So I think that they were expecting this crazy story from this crazy guy. And oh my God, he wants to kill everybody. And she didn't get that story, right? She got an articulate, intelligent, educated, well thought person. And, and so I think that that made it somewhat not sensational enough to publish. Uh, because I think that the, the, the public has this image of the fuck the cops guy and the mainstream image of that is not what portrayed there. And I think that had she published that, then they might've been you know, saying, oh, hey, maybe this guy's not so bad and, and like shift people towards my side. Um, also, I'm not sure that she ever legitimately, genuinely intended to publish it. The, the media has avoided me like the plague, right? Like they blur me out of videos that I'm in the background in. I have had channel two people in the past say, hey, we've been trying to get you covered, but our producer won't let us. And uh, they've been told absolutely not. So my media coverage has been practically nil, and yet I'm more well recognized than the mayor. So no, I'm not convinced that she intended to put me on the media. Um, I am, in my mind, I'm convinced that it was an attempt by law enforcement to circumvent the protections of my attorney. Now, I, I have to ask this. People have alleged that you have threatened public officials, that you offered thoughts and prayers that a specific public official received violence. How do you respond to this? So I have, I have to respond to that by, uh, by remaining silent on that question because it speaks at a fundamental essential element to an upcoming criminal prosecution. So unfortunately, I must reciprocate the, the respect that with all due respect, I'm not able to clarify that question for you. And I'll have to allow the existing public record to speak for itself. The point of this show is not to adjudicate the charges against Mr. Brandt, nor is it to simply criticize the media for playing a role against him or any other citizen who engages in dissent. The idea is to illuminate just how much policing relies on the rhetorical embrace of media to make its case for its exceptional powers conferred upon it. As you may have noticed in the parlance of police rhetoric, legitimate criticism is often framed as being against the police. In fact, any attempt to hold cops accountable is viewed as an assault upon the institution itself. In other words, policing 
through an endless parade of cop shows has watered down the notion of accountability to the anti-democratic theory that you are either for us or against us with no middle ground. And let's recognize that this all or nothing rhetorical posturing is not an invention of the people, but rather a construct fully fashioned by an industry which thrives on fear as a recipe for dominance. Just imagine if your public works department or city council made the same argument. Imagine if they conjured up enemies and fictive mortal threats to berate you into obedience. Imagine if they kept raising our taxes to pay for pricier pensions, more generous benefits, and a set of laws that affords rights only accessible to them. How would any other institution subject to a democracy build such an insular fortress of beneficence and plunder? Well, as you can see from our analysis of policing, you build it through fear. And then you co-opt the institutions that would hold you accountable to warp the process meant to ensure that you serve the people. That's why police work so hard to co-opt journalists like us. That's why police department have well-funded and well-staffed PR outfits. That's why the police make the choice between support and criticism no choice at all. Let's remember that an institution imbued with violence and empowered to subvert our constitutional rights cannot achieve this alone. It needs a partner, and unfortunately, sometimes it's us. I would like to thank Eric Brandt for speaking with us today. Eric, thank you for your time. Thank you, Tay, I appreciate your time. And I have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, reporting, and editing on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Tay, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank friend of the show, Noli D, for her support. Thanks, Noli D. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at the Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. I do read your comments, appreciate them, and I try to answer your questions whenever I can. My name is Taya Graham, and I am your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.